And I've been listening to CNN talk about the coming hurricane season. You know, they do that every year. They watch those storms lining up. They begin to name them. And the residents on the beaches begin to think about what they'll do if one comes their way. Well, whenever they talk about the hurricanes, I remember the summer of 1945. 1945 at Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. My daddy was in the U.S. Army Air Corps in 1945, and he was overseas. He was stationed in India. And my mother was going to be uh, alone that summer. We would be out of school with her three daughters. Me, I'm the oldest, Linda and Kathy. So my grandmother said to her, y'all go down to the beach, take the house, and live there for the summer. Mother sublet our apartment, took a leave of absence from her job, and that's what we did. Granny drove us down. When Granny went back, we had no car. So we had to walk everywhere we went. Now, let me just explain where we were and what it looked like around us so that you'll know what I'm talking about as I go along. My grandmother's house was on Harbor Island and Wrightsville Beach. You go to Wilmington, go out toward the beach, cross a drawbridge, cross marshlands when you leave the mainland, uh, up the causeway to Channel Drive. And that's Harbor Island because right there in front of you is another bridge that crosses the Sound, a quiet body of water fed by the Atlantic. And once you cross that bridge, you're at the beach. My grandmother's house was the last house on Channel Drive all the way at the end. It sat up on stilts, and in the front was the Sound, and the water was held back by a wooden bulkhead. To the right-hand side, there was uh, more houses that would go back up the street. On the left-hand side were marshes. This was the end, the end of the land. And behind it, the marsh land that led over to the inland waterway. Well, every afternoon, my mother dressed us in clean pinafores, put on our strappy sandals, so that we could walk up Channel Drive across that bigger bridge to the Catholic Church, Mary by the Sea, because she was praying my daddy home. Every day she went to church to pray a novena and light a candle. Now that takes care of him. I never worried about whether or not my daddy was going to come home because mama was on the job. She was praying him back. And sure enough, he came back a year later. When we walked across the bridge, we didn't go across the car side. There was a wooden pedestrian bridge that started out. You walked up onto it and it went higher and higher and higher so that the sailboats could go under it because it wasn't a drawbridge. It didn't have a section that lifted up. One afternoon we were walking over and we stopped to look down at the speedboats that were flashing underneath the bridge pulling the water skiers, leaving a big white wake behind them. And then when they'd go, the water would settle down again, and you could see silver flashes of schools of fish as they skimmed on by. One afternoon, we were standing there. We were watching all of this going on down below. I was holding my white cotton hat that my mother had made me. It was a Dutch girl hat for a dance at the end of the year at school. I had it in my hand over the side of that bridge, way up above the water. And the ties were just blowing in the breeze back and forth. Can you imagine? I looked over there and 
my fingers opened. They did. My fingers just opened, and that hat fell out, and it just drifted right down till it fell on the top of the green water, and the streamers, well, they just flowed behind it, and as it got heavier and heavier, it sank out of sight. My mother turned. She saw the disappearing hat down on the surface of the water. What are you doing? I didn't know how to answer that, but I did understand right at that minute that she wasn't seeing the same beauty of it that I was. People came and went that summer to come down and keep my mother company. And that was okay, relatives or friends, and that was fun, and Mama had a better time. And it didn't matter to me too much, except when my Aunt Catherine brought my cousin Sandra down. Sandra and I were just three months apart, she being the older. And we were giggle partners and partners in crime for a lot of things. I was so excited she was coming. The afternoon that they arrived, it started to rain. Heavy, heavy rain, drenching rain. You couldn't go outside in this kind of rain. You couldn't see beyond it. And it just pelted down on the sound and on the roof. You could hear it, the staccato sounds of those big, big drops of rain hitting the roof. The next morning, Sandra and I got up early, as kids will do, and it was dark outside. And we decided to go down into the basement. The basement was sand with boardwalks so that you could get to various parts of the basement. And there were shelves down there. There were things to play with. There was a platform that was a little room. And it was a fun place. It was like a dollhouse kind of thing. And we went down to play. But when we went down and walked up toward the big front door, the double doors of the basement, water was pushing in under the door. Just pushing in. There was about a, li uh, about a half an inch. And water was just pouring in under there. And I looked out the window. And the whole yard was covered in water. We ran upstairs and we looked out the living room window toward the front yard while there were white caps lapping up over and across the bulkhead into the, into the front yard. Mama, Mama, don't bother me, she turned over. I looked out the bedroom window that faced the back toward the waterway. There was nothing but water and it was coming up. You couldn't even see the marshes anymore. If you saw marshes, it was just the tips sticking out from under the water. I couldn't make out the bridge because the rain was coming down so heavy. We ran and looked out the front. The waves were getting bigger and bigger coming across the bulkhead. Out the kitchen window, which faced toward that empty side where the land ended, the water had moved up, and it was almost to the edge of the house. We were surrounded by water on three sides. I went in. I shook my mother. Wake up. There's something happening. There's water everywhere. Always I hear it. It's a northeaster. Go to bed. It's fine. Just go back to bed. Go to sleep. Sandra went in and woke Cocky up, and she said, it's nothing. It's nothing. We turned on the radio, and the first announcement we heard was the announcer saying, evacuate the beach. Buses to evacuate the beach. I ran back to mother, and Sandra ran in to tell Cocky. Now, Cocky sat up straight in her bed as soon as she heard the word evacuate. She had been at Wrightsville Beach in this very house two years before when they had had to back the car out and drive to Wilmington with the water slapping up against their wheels as they drove. She was at attention. She looked out the front. She looked out the back. She looked out both sides. And Louie, get up. We are in trouble here. Mother came up 
And she came and looked, and we opened the back door. You could hardly see out for the rain. And up the street, you could make out the shape of an armed bus. She slipped a raincoat on over me and said, Eloise, run up there and tell him we don't have a car, and we'll have to get these children together, and we'll be right there. I ran out. When I ran out into the rain, the rain was hitting me hard. It was plastering my hair down to my head, hitting me right in the face. I got to the bus and pounded on the side. Whoosh! A young soldier opened the bus so that I could see him. We're here. Are you to take us? Are you to take us off? Are you our evacuation? Yeah. Yeah, I am, little girl, and I'm the last bus. Well, my mom and my aunt, my sisters, my cousin, can you wait till they get here? I'll wait because I'm your last chance to get off this beach. We got in. My mother showed us that in her pocketbook, all she had was a toothbrush and a wet washcloth. That's all she thought to pick up. Sandra and I were watching when we Across the causeway going into Wilmington, the water was lapping up off the marshes. There was no road that you could see. Trees were falling on all sides of us. And Sandra and I just sat there and laughed and laughed and laughed because that's all we knew how to do. We got into Wilmington and we went to the Salvation Army. They gave us a sandwich, a glass of juice, and time for mother and Coggy to decide what to do. They had to get rid of the kids so they could find us a place to stay. And they decided to call a movie theater that my uncle printed posters for and ask if we could stay there all afternoon while they found a place for us to stay. The woman said yes, and she let us in. It was warm and dry, and it was a relief to be there. And Mama and Cocky sat us down in a near-empty theater and went off to find a hotel. Ordinarily, that would have been perfect. We would have been so happy. That would have been absolutely perfect, except it was a black-and-white film 1943, Simone, Simone, in the cat people. And this cat kept coming out and killing girls. And I sat for the entire afternoon with my head in my lap. But they found a hotel room. And the next morning, the rain had stopped and warm and dry, we took an army bus back to the beach. And as we drove down Channel Drive, you could see the sound out front. It was still and as quiet as a mill pond, as though nothing had happened. That's nature for you, isn't it? 